Five, four, three, two, one. Thank you for joining us again for another episode of Meet the Candidate. Today we have David Davenport here running for the state representative 5th district seat, and we want you to get a closer and more in-depth view on your next or possible next candidate for this position. Mr. Davenport, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, first of all, I'd like to thank you all for inviting me. Mm -hmm. um, of course, my name's David Davenport. Um, I was born and raised in Dayton, Ohio. I wasn't born and raised here in Flint, Michigan, but I've been here for 12 years. And the 12 years that I've been here, um, I have two sons. Um, I've been elected, I am an elected official to the Flint Board of Education. Mm -hmm. um, I'm on different subcommittees, academic, uh, finance. Um, I have been on the uh, community relations, also human resources um, subcommittees. And this is what um, I feel that will make me the uh, most qualified candidate to uh, run for this seat. Um, other than I've been where you've been and I know where you're coming from, I, because I'm mostly spent most of my time here in Genesee County. Um, mm -hmm. Unlike my opponent that spends most of his time in Washington. So uh, it's just, that's basically what you need to know about me for now. Okay. Why are you a non-party non affiliation? I'm non-party affiliation because a while back I um, was educated to the fact that Democrats used to be Republicans and Republicans used to be Democrats. And I said to myself, it seems like to me it's nothing but a title that people use to have us battling back and forth between each other. Mm -hmm. And then I also noticed foremost that Jesus was not affiliated with a party. And if I claim to be a Christian and I'm walking and I want to walk like Jesus, mm -hmm. then I have to do what he did. And that's take myself away from the, the, uh, the, the, the extra that goes on inside of the world. Mm -hmm. And I clearly believe that when I go to Congress, I want to treat the Republicans and the Democrats and the non-party affiliations the same as I would, you know, any, any other uh, party affiliation. Okay. So that's strongly why I chose um, and it's not just this year. I've been that way for years because I clearly um, hate discrimination. Mm -hmm. And we as a people hate discrimination, but we choose to do it in certain scenarios like uh, political parties. We're using it as that. And if we want to stop it altogether, then we just need to stop it, period. Okay. Uh, what are the most important agenda, agenda items on your platform? My most important agenda items, which I do have many, okay, <laughs> uh, uh, my most important would be the seniors um, should not have to pay property tax. Um, I feel like that um, there are many houses sitting right now in the Genesee County Land Bank that are not being paid taxes on or anything. They're just sitting there. So here we are bothering our seniors that have gotten us where we are today and asking, making them wonder where they're going to have to lay their heads mm -hmm. at night you know, uh, over no reason at all, I feel like. I feel like they have gotten us where we are, and I think they should have vouchers to cover their property tax every year, um, no matter what it is. Um, the second thing that's most important would be all education needs to be funded through the federal government. I clearly believe that college tuitions, um, just because I'm poor and I don't have the money, I can get a scholarship or a grant. But say if your parents are rich, then you can't get a scholarship mm -hmm. or a grant. That's crazy. First of all, I'm punishing you for, what you, for your parents' success. And mm -hmm. I feel like that's totally wrong. All children are the same, no matter what. And when, when, they, when they exit high school, it makes it seem like they're grown. They're adults. No, they're not. They're not adults. They're still young minds that need to be trained and I feel like if we fund education from um, uh, kindergarten all the way up to to high school then we need to at least go a step further associate's degree or the full four years mm -hmm. um, where we would get this money is our defense we're spending 606 million dollars a year over uh, for foreign aid um, uh, defense and I, I think that's some money that we need to bring back to the United States of America and educate our children properly, our future mm -hmm. properly, instead of over here spending it, spending it on other countries that turn around and kill us, right. okay. <laughs> you know, after we help them get to where they need to be. 
So uh, there, there's just a lot of things that I think that we have wrong with this country that needs to be changed, and I'd be more willing to go up and um, fight for it. Okay. What are your positions or opinions on Public Act 4? Public Act 4, that's an interesting, uh, that's an interesting question. To me, Public Act 4, well, to me, a public act is needed, whether it's 72 or 4, in a state, just in case we have um, a, 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 a city that the leaders can't balance the budget or function with the budget. I definitely think that there needs to be a public act there, but Public Act 4 is too... Uh, uh, too strong, too, 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 too uh, how, do, how do you call it when it, it's too overbearing. O overbearing. I mean, it's just like they've come in and hijacked this mm -hmm. city and said, hey, we're taking over. You got to do what we say, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and there's no other way around it. Now, the, 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 the reason I feel that there should be a public act is, is that you should not be able to dress Ned DeWino up and put a tie on him and get 40 signatures and then mm -hmm. say, hey, he's running for office. Once he gets elected, he's over millions of dollars. And guess what? Ned DeWino only knows about drinking. You know, he knows he knows nothing about uh, uh, finances. So in Congress, I would uh, try to pass a bill, legislation, that would that would state that if before you want run for an elected position mm -hmm. that do, deals with finances, you would have to take courses that you would have to pass before you could even get on the ballot. Mm -hmm. to be a, to become elected. This way we won't have many people getting in these seats not knowing what they're doing and uh, the government steady going down. Would so that would that on. apply to those who have uh, business degrees or any type of or degrees where uh, from a four-year institution where having finance courses or um, advanced math, mathematical courses are a requirement? Would you require those also to take these additional courses as far as finance, and finance is concerned? Well, <clears throat> that, that would have to be said, but 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 I, I would say if you got a degree in art or something like that, mm -hmm. you would still have to take those courses. And I would say no, I, I would say yes, that they would still have to take the courses. This way we know as citizens that they are qualified, not just by what the degree said, but that we know that they are qualified because anybody really can get a piece of paper and put something on it. So I would say clearly that we would definitely have to, um, they would definitely have to take those courses. Okay. Being a, a United States representative comes with a lot of different controversial I issues and those including but not, are not limited to abortion as well as gay rights. What are, what are your stance on these issues? Okay. <laughs> Interesting. My stance on abortion, and I've been a Christian all my life, okay. The Bible says thou shalt not kill. Thou shall not kill. And I truly feel like if once um, um, once the egg is um, uh, uh, formed, that's a human life. Um, that's a human life. That's the same way as a, if a chicken once the chicken, once the egg is had, once the egg is formed, that's that's a that's a live chicken, mm -hmm. no matter whether you think it is or not. Mm -hmm. And the Bible says thou shalt not kill, and I will not go against that, no matter what. Okay. So that's something that I'll have to deal with as far as my election is concerned. And your, your, your seat and your opinion on gay rights? Gay rights. Gay rights is of that person. You, you know, me and President Obama, we do agree on that. Um, gay rights is of that person. Who am I to judge who that person is supposed to love? I have nothing to do with that person's life. Mm -hmm. That person has to answer to God later on. I don't have to answer. Mm -hmm. So my thing is as is, 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 is if... If they choose to do that, then so be it. It's not interfering with, with, with as far as the country's finances or anything like that, uh, how the country uh, uh, functions. That's my goal as a congressman, to go in and worry about things like that. Not whether or not somebody is in love with somebody and should they be together for the rest of their life. So, okay, um, I can hear our viewers screaming this question, so I'm going to ask. <laughs> that would obviously, it to me and, and to our viewers, I could see the next question being, that same opinion on abortion, what would be the difference between that being that person's that person's stance and that person's life, along with who they love, as far as whether having a child or whether they're 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 loving someone of the same sex as them? What what would be your answer to that? Is that still none of your business? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I wouldn't say that. But I would truly say that gay marriage and abortion mm -hmm. are two separate uh, uh, two separate items. Mm -hmm. Gay marriage is. You're loving someone. Abortion is 
you're taking a life. Mm -hmm. that, that, that that's really really there's no uh, comparison because I don't want to take a life, but mm -hmm. if you want to bond a life together to be happy, I would definitely be for that. So that you, you know that's the, that's the difference in in between it. One is taking a life, mm -hmm. the other one is making a life happy and enjoying life. Okay. So clearly, um, I, I I would choose to be over here enjoying okay. and keeping it happy. Okay, okay. How would you use your this seat if you were elected to um, decrease the crime in our community or or in Detroit or uh, statewide and on a local level? What would you do to make sure that we're combating our issue with crime here? Well. The, the first thing about crime is is that I feel like crime is instilled from lack of education. Mm -hmm. And this is something that we have to adjust to and we have to push more. And this is why I say that the federal government should fund education. Mm -hmm. We have to push more for educating the uneducated. It doesn't matter when they wake up and understand that they're uneducated. Mm -hmm we need to fund their education at that time. Right. Like right now we have a, a, a adult adults want to go to school want to go to dip, to uh, get their GED mm -hmm. but they can't because of the funding. Uh, uh, the schools are turning them away because they're adults and they're only getting a certain amount. Mm -hmm. I think that we should start certifying d different places as long as they're a, a, a certified course that would th that if a person wants to go get a GED, they can get it with, just like that with no money, with no problem. Mm -hmm. And this way, this way, you would have more people off the streets as far as um, understanding what crime is about. Mm -hmm. Now, I also think that we should reach our teenage to uh, 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 middle twenties. As far as crime is concerned, we need more for them to do here in the communities. In the communities, we need to get them out of the streets. Their recreation centers are closed down. Uh, 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 there are hardly any jobs for them. Uh, I, I mean, I mean, we, we we have tennis dilapidated tennis courts here, mm -hmm. and clearly, there's no. We could tear those poles down and let it be a skating ring. Mm -hmm if we chose to. So what I would do is I would go up and I would pay someone out of my salary to look for grants to cover all of these problems that we're having. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty sure that there are grants up there. Mm -hmm. We just got to have someone that's willing to get up there and go look for it for the betterment of the of, of the counties, of the communities. Okay, what, if anything, would you do differently than those who are currently in the position that you're hoping to be elected in? Well, the first thing I would do differently um, I can truly say that my um, opponent. Uh, Thirty seconds. Okay, my <laughs> opponent clearly um, is not down here with us. Um, I, I would go up, and I would definitely um, look for um, uh, grants, mm -hmm. and, and and make it more. Uh, visible that I'm looking for the grants to change to what's going on in the community. Okay, just to close out our interview, I want to give you a chance to speak directly to our viewers and let them know why they should vote for you over your opponent and let them know what you will be bringing and what you'll be doing for our city. Well, I would like to say to you all that I've been fighting on this road for a long, a long, long time. A lot of you know me, a lot of you know, heard of me, a lot of people say that I'm crazy, a lot of people say that I'm uh, a fair person, but I'm asking you to support me, David Davenport, non-party affiliation on November 6, 2012 for United States Representative of the 5th District here in the state of Michigan. And I guarantee you that you will have someone that will fight for what's right for you all. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us on Meet the Candidate. We will return. And you're clear. All right. You gotta see this. See this frog? I add boiling water. No, wait, 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 wait. See that? He jumps out. Smart frog. Now this guy, he's just as smart, but he won't jump out. Could jump out, 
But he won't. Really? He'll just stay in the beaker as the temperature slowly rises, never noticing, until he boils alive. Why doesn't he just get out? I mean, if he can get out, he should just get out. Right? I still remember that night. Dad said, don't do anything stupid, be safe. We didn't think about what could happen. Like the call when we found out about the accident. I didn't even know they left the party. Don't do anything stupid. He never imagined the lawsuits, how it affect his life savings, our relationship, or his freedom. Dad thought he was being a cool dad that night. What I needed was a father. Underage drinking, when you host, everyone loses. Welcome back to Meet the Candidate. I'm your host, Kamora Cochran, and tonight I'm here with Scotty Bowman, and he wants to be your next United States Senate. He wants to be a part of the next United States Senate. So we're going to let you get an inside glimpse of who he is and why you should vote for him. Scotty, can you give us a, um, a little brief synopsis about yourself and, and who you are? Tell us about yourself. Well, I've been involved in the liberty movement since the 1980s, and I have run in every statewide election since 1994. I've always run on a pro-liberty um, small government platform and I currently am a professor. I teach math and I teach physics and physical science mm -hmm. at Macomb Community College and at Wayne Community College District. Okay. Why did you decide to run for this office? Well, I saw that our country was in trouble and that establishment politicians were only exacerbating the problem. I didn't see that either of the major parties were really going to stop the practice of growing government and creating the great debt that is now um, hurting our country. And so that's when I um, really felt that I need to get involved and try to change things because no one else is. Okay, definitely understand that. Please let us know what you believe is the biggest issue facing Michigan at this time and what you will try to do positively to, to impact that issue here in our, in, in, in our country and it's especially here in our state. Well, it's the current economic depression. Mm -hmm. And currently we have a situation where the states and the local communities have had to tighten their belt because they don't have a privilege of printing money out of thin air or of running serial deficits. That is not true for the federal government, which has had, um, by practice, legislated its own debt ceiling increases and has been able to borrow money with um, very little limitation as a result of our Federal Reserve System. So the one thing that I'd change is I would um, end the practice by our federal government of s deficit spending, and which in turn creates debt, which in turn brings down our economy. And to do that, I would mean having to reform the Federal Reserve System by first um, having a full audit and then ultimately um, phasing it out. And otherwise, what's going to happen is the federal government will continue to grow, and that does have a cost. Even if we're not taxed for that growth, it ends up being taken from us anyway by diminishing the value of our currency. Okay, if that is the, the main concern at the time for you and, and our country, please let us know how you would address this issue. Would it be spending cuts or tax increases? Exactly how, what, what do you believe is the answer to the, to the problem? I believe in spending cuts because for one thing we've reached a point where taxation is so high that any increase in taxation will only reduce productivity and so you're really not going to get more out of it anyway. Secondly, I feel taxation is immoral because it is a form of theft from one group of people to give to another. Um, but furthermore, we can't really tax ourselves fast enough to keep up with spending. Rather, what we need to do is we need to cut the spending, which is already not being paid for. It's not being paid for directly anyhow. What's happening is we're borrowing money and that's increasing debt. And as I've said, um, that is reducing the value of the money that people save. Mm -hmm. It is in a sense robbing people of their savings. Mm -hmm. And it is causing the um, economies at the local and state level to go broke because they can't keep up with that kind of system. Mm -hmm. So we need to cut the spending. And as far as, well, how would people pay for get the services that the federal government, for instance, is providing. Well, my answer to that is every dollar 
that they spend is somehow, whether it's by debasing the currency or by taxes, it's all taken from us anyway. Mm -hmm. And so what would happen is we'd have that money, it would stay in our pockets or it would stay in our communities or it would stay in our states. Okay. Okay. How do you believe that uh, the federal government, if at all, should define marriage? I don't believe the federal government should define marriage. Mm -hmm. In fact, I don't believe any government should do that. Um, there's two ways in which one can look at this. And one way is as a religious sacrament. As a religious sacrament, um, it is not in the enumerated powers of Congress to define religious sacraments. On the contrary, it's strictly prohibited in the First Amendment for the federal government or um, to be involved in um, an establishment of a government religion. And through the 14th, it also now means that state governments can't be doing that either. Right. Now, um, on, the, on the other hand, um, we have relationships established by contract. And people should be able to enter into contracts that suit their particular situation. And it shouldn't be up to the government to tell them which contracts they can and can't have, mm -hmm. but rather um, people should be able to write their own contracts and make their own arrangements as they see fit. Finally, I would be for ending all government discrimination on the basis of marital status. For one thing, it violates Section 1 of the 14th Amendment. But for another matter, it's um, just really none of their business. And I believe that we should have everybody treated equally under the law as the as for section one chapter of the 14th amendment says okay, okay. tell me what your idea or what type of uh, foreign policy do you support i support a non-interventionist foreign policy and that would mean that we stop these um, costly crusades. Earlier I talked about cutting spending. Right. We could cut spending a whole lot um, is if we change our foreign policy. If we keep the current foreign policy, it's impossible. It's an expensive foreign policy because mm -hmm. it involves us paying for the defense of our competitors. It involves us intervening in the affairs of other nations and trying to rebuild them in our image and failing miserably at that. Um, it, what we should do is devote our foreign policy exclusively to our own defense and stop trying to be policemen of the world. Mm -hmm. And we should also stop foreign aid. Foreign aid is simply taking from the poor of the rich countries to give to the rich of the poor countries. I understand what you're saying. Okay, what, are, what do you believe in one of the greatest threats to American liberties, uh, American civil liberties, oh, excuse me? Okay, well, in the end of last year, or the beginning of this year, um, the National Defense Authorization Act became law. Now, the National Author Defense Authorization Act was a fairly routine bill except for detainee provisions, which I believe would be Section 1021 now. And those detainee provisions allow for, at the whim of this or any future president, people to be taken prisoner by the military, right. held indefinitely without trial or due process. And so I consider this a fundamental threat to our civil liberties. And um, basically, it's, it unfortunately had bipartisan support across the board. So it's not even a matter of one party or another as far as the majors go, which is another reason why we need to get other people in there, because we can't count on the establishment politicians to protect our civil liberties. Okay, you talk a lot about rights, um, but what exactly do you mean by that? Are you including health care, education, food, housing? What exactly are, are you referring to when you say our, our rights as, as people here? Okay, well, I believe okay. rights are, are those things which people automatically have unless somebody takes away your ability to exercise those rights. And for instance, we automatically have our lives, we automatically have a, an ability to make decisions, and those decisions can result in the accumulation of property when gotten by a voluntary um, interaction. Now, to assert that, for instance, um, food, health care, or housing are rights is um, to basically ask for something, unless, unless these things are given to you or earned, is to ask for something that is um, to be taken and to take something from someone else and to assert a demand on someone else that, to, that they provide a service is in a sense asserting a right to enslave. If you say you have a right to food, you're enslaving the farmer by making them grow the food. If you say you have a right to health care, you enslave a physician by saying you have to provide this. If you say you have a right to housing, you enslave the builder by saying you have to build this. And if you say, well, I'm going to pay them and I'll just take the money from everyone else, then that's who you're enslaving. Mm -hmm. Okay, Jeff, and thank you for clearing that up for our viewers. Do you support an audit of the Federal Reserve? Absolutely. This institution has an extreme power to, um, that affects our economy in the sense of being able to uh, literally print what we call money, 
Um, they have um, do a lot of this in secret right now, and it severely affects the value of our currency. It, it, get, it puts money in the pockets of some groups to the expense of others. And without an audit, it's hard to really know what they're doing and um, who's benefiting from this. And everyone has a right to have this information. Um, ultimately, I think the entire system needs to be replaced. But currently, um, the first step, whether you want to keep the Federal Reserve System or reform it, or get rid of it, mm -hmm. is we need to have a full audit. Okay. What uh, would you do differently, if anything, compared to your opponents or and those who are currently in this position that you are trying to be elected to? to? Okay, for one thing, I differ, for instance, from um, my Republican opponent, Pete Hoekstra, in that I would strongly oppose any um, bailouts, such as the one he, he supported to the banksters when he was in the House of Representatives. Mm -hmm. I would um, strongly oppose, for instance, the Brady Bill or the D.C. gun ban that Pete Hoekstra supported. Mm -hmm. I would strongly oppose things like the National Defense Authorization Act I referred mm -hmm. to earlier that Debbie Stabenow voted for. So um, I'm for less government intervention and more individual liberty, which neither of the major party candidates stand for. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do libertarians really believe in legalizing drugs? Yes, we do. And some people find it to be quirkish or weird, but in my opinion, it is actually an example of how we are much more sensible than the other parties. Because what we have here is a situation where um, you're, for one thing, the people who make drug laws are controlling, trying to control the behavior, personal behavior of individuals, and in a sense, create, trying to control the way in which they modify their own thoughts. And I think this is a fundamental privacy issue at that level. And then we have from a constitutional perspective, the federal constitution doesn't give the federal government the power to regulate intrastate commerce, that's trade within states. So any drug laws that go beyond trade between states or imports are, are purely unconstitutional. It's mm -hmm. not something they even have the power to do. That's why they needed a constitutional amendment for alcohol prohibition. Mm -hmm. um, they just started ignoring the constitution after that. The, um, finally, there's the practical matter, which is this policy has become very expensive. It involves, it's costly to, to enforce these laws, to put people in prison, um, and it doesn't solve the problem that it was supposedly designed to solve in the sense that we have not diminished um, the abuse of drugs or the devastating effect of abuse of drugs on people. So there were problems before. Those problems didn't go away with drug prohibition. And um, there's other new problems that were created. So it's a bad policy across the board that um, libertarians recognize needs to be done away with. All righty, we have about 30 seconds, and I want to give you the opportunity to speak directly to our viewers and let them know why they should check off the box for Bowman on November 6th. Okay, well, and you can find out more about me at scottybowman.org. That's B-O-M-A-N, my last name is spelled. And I would strongly urge you to vote for me because I am a candidate who is going to advocate change. I will be a consistent, reliable voice for individual liberty in the United States Senate, always voting um, to protect your money, to protect your liberty, and protect your safety, and to keep the federal government out of your personal business. Thank you for watching Meet the Candidate, and we will be back. for your future at Mott Community College. Three, two, one, race.
Hi, this is Jim Scroviero. We're here at Skid Marks Raceway. We're here racing our slot cars. It's made in Flint. We're proud of it. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Meet the Candidate. Today we have with us Vera Perry from Flint School Board C. Welcome. Thank you for having me. No problem. We are just excited to have you here and we would love to let the community get answers direct, directly from you about why they should make sure that you return to the Flint School Board seat this fall and November 6th to be exact. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself, that things maybe the community hasn't even learned yet or just things that you would like them to know about you? Well, I am a Flintstone, original Flintstone, mm -hmm. born and raised here. I graduated from Flint Southwestern. A hundred years ago, I always <laughs> tell people. Uh, I am a mother of three sons, grown sons, um, and I'm just very active in the community. I just love my community. Mm. I'm retired from Delphi. Uh, I've been retired now eight years, okay. and I actually worked 31 and a half years. Oh, wow. Wow. Well, thank you. Thank you for your service to our community. What thank experience you. do you bring to the school board? We'll be bringing back to the school board once you're elected. Well, I've been elected twice, mm -hmm. so this is my second term I'm on. If I'm reelected, it'll be my third term. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been president. I've been treasurer. I've been uh, assistant secretary treasurer. Um, have made some big, tough, rough decisions mm -hmm. uh, through the course of those 10 years that I've been serving. So I, I think I bring a lot of experience. Okay, we appreciate that. Please let us know what are the crucial events that you think um, are impacting our students, our parents, um, and our teachers, anybody that's affected by the Flint schools d directly. Let us know what you think are the, are the most pivotal issues. Well, the decline in student enrollment, uh, the declining funding, which is tied to right. student enrollment, mm -hmm. and our and poor test scores. Okay. Yeah, we've okay. got to do something. We've got to come up with something to help our students to do better. Okay. What? Why do you? Can you let us know from the viewers and some that may or may not know and already and aren't able to attend the school board meetings or just are not knowledgeable on the reasons behind this, the school closings here in our community? Well, in 1968, we had approximately 48,000 to 50,000 students in this district. Mm -hmm. There's been a decline ever since then. We're down now to um, maybe 8,000 at this point. Okay. Um, a lot of it is due to the uh, leaving of General Motors. Mm -hmm. uh, Jobs basically have declined, you know, have declined uh, in Flint, and people are leaving. Right. Uh, we used to have about a hundred thousand children in all the Genesee County going to school. We're down to about sixty thousand kids in all of Genesee County. Okay. So that's letting people know that kids have uh, families have left the city, the county, and the state. Right. Um, so you can't have all those buildings. Right. You can't be putting a million dollars into a building for uh, utilities, mm -hmm. uh, maintenance on the building. Mm -hmm. That money can be better served doing something else. So we have to close the schools. The population is shifting. Mm -hmm. At one time, it was a huge population on the north side. Still, the north end has the most students. Mm -hmm. However, the population isn't as big. Mm -hmm. And so you, you've got to start closing. And that's the hardest thing to do yeah. is to close the school. Understandable. Can you let us know some of the accomplishments that the community and, and at large may not be aware of, of the, the accomplishments that the board has had since you've been a member of the Flint School Board? Well, we, um, we have continually cut 20 to $25 million out of our budget. Mm -hmm. And believe me, just think back, if I've been on the board for 10 years, mm -hmm. and every year we cut 20 to $25 million, yeah. uh, that's a lot of it money is. we've cut. Uh, we've downsized administration. We used to be very, very heavy on administration. Mm -hmm. We're continually downsizing our administration. And we're bringing more and more technology into the buildings because our students have their cell phones, right. they have the iPads and all those other things that I don't even know what to call them, <laughs> and they want to use them. So we're beginning to really do a lot around those pieces mm -hmm. so students can do their work, uh, look up information, yeah. and keep try to make school or keep school very exciting for them. Yeah, and then that may be one of the reasons, but can you give us another example of why you, you believe wholeheartedly that the Flint schools is still the best choice? 
Well, we have the advanced placement now uh, mm -hmm. test that students can take. And in fact, one of our students took the test and she has a perfect score, wow. 24. Wow. And she's a senior this year at mm -hmm. Northwestern. Um, we have the IB program, the International Baccalaureate program, which at this point is housed at Southwestern Classical. Mm -hmm. And that program in itself uh, just gives a child the, the chance to do their research. It's not, the answers are not given to them totally. You have a chance to go out and research that information for yourself and present it yourself. Okay. So it's a really excellent program. And um, we have the partnership with the Flint Cultural Center, oh, okay. which um, is really good because sometimes children do not get the opportunity, especially if they're on one side of town, right. to take advantage of that. Right. So we get a chance to go, you know, the, the school bus brings them over and they have a chance to go to the art uh, uh, institute, um, mm -hmm. the music. Right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's those great, are some great things great. that we have. Okay. Can you let us know, uh, the, the parents that are watching, what are the best methods and ways that they can work with the administration, the school board, um, the teachers, everybody that, that's in the school? How can they work with them um, to, for the best interest of the student? Well, parents, we need our students mm -hmm. prepared for school. Yes. They need to have a good night's sleep. They need to have some breakfast. They really need a hug before they they walk out the door. Mm -hmm. uh, they need their homework completed. We need parents to read to their students mm -hmm. and allow their students to read to them yeah. and have constant contact with the building staff. And what I mean by that, you can come up to the building, you can find out information about your student, um, and there's a way to come to the building. Uh, it's no secret that sometimes parents come up in a, a way that people will not want to respond, mm -hmm. but you come and you present yourself in an appropriate way mm -hmm. and get the information you need because truly students plus teachers plus parents equals success. Without one of those right. components, there will be no success and we're definitely wanting success with every student we have in our district. That's understandable. Can you let us know if you had two wishes to be granted for our city? Um, for direct, directly to enhance our school districts here in the Flint Community Schools, what would they be? Number one would definitely be safety. Mm -hmm. If our city was safe, mm -hmm. more safe than what it is, then that would ensure that our school buildings would be safe. Mm -hmm. uh, students would be okay to walk to school. Right. They, it would be fine for them to walk home. Mm -hmm. um, so safety is one of the ones that I wish could happen and then unlimited funding because the state of Michigan as well as the federal government they continually want to cut funding mm -hmm. and when you cut funding so bad eventually that will affect what happens inside of a classroom or in that building mm -hmm. which may um, stop a child from getting some information or mm -hmm. progressing where they need to progress. Yeah, that's understandable. It, it, to piggyback off of that, how has the Flint Community Schools addressed the issue of bullying? I know it's, it's a big issue nationwide now. There's campaigns on ending bullying and, and trying to make sure students know that it gets better, but how have we addressed it here in our community with our Flint Community Schools? Well, the Flint Board has written policy, which I'm excited about, mm -hmm. and we were one of the first, if, I, if, if not one of, we were the first district in the county to have a bully policy. Okay. We also have t-shirts and we do uh, things every year with students, uh, artwork, uh, poetry slams, all kind of little things that the kids can be involved in. And we also have in place a 24-hour call-in where parents, mm -hmm. students can call in and report an incident. Yeah. And so we've we've really jumped on the bullying because we do know that's a problem. Okay. Um, give me an example on how you've worked with people, and, and maybe it's even board members who don't uh, necessarily agree with your philosophy or your values or, or your votes. How have you managed to, to get past that and still be the, the board member that you are? Well, for me, my campaign has always said from 2001, I ran in 2001 and lost that election, but my campaign at that time definitely said it's all about the children. Mm -hmm. And so every vote, every decision, everything I do centers around those students, it centers around their parents, and it mm -hmm. also centers around their staff. Mm -hmm. And I try to bring information um, or those kinds of things that will help the board mm -hmm. see 
Also, other board members bring things to the table that maybe I haven't seen and say, okay, I can live with this or I can see how that right. happens. But it's always, always, always been about the children for me. Understandable. Un taking everything into consideration that our, our school districts are going through, I understand there's a lot of criticism from even parents that had their student school shut down or, or administrators that don't believe they have everything that they need. Let us know how you have, have dealt with criticism and have used it to, to your advantage or have been able to, to use that to progress the schools. How, how, do you, how, how do you take the heavy criticism that comes along with that elected position? It's hard taking that criticism. <laughs> um, but I try to take it and turn it around to something mm -hmm. positive. Uh, yes, we've closed a lot of schools. Uh, my elementary school and my junior high school are closed. The only school that is open now is still my high school. Mm -hmm. uh, who's to say in the future that won't close? Mm -hmm. Don't know, okay? Right. Right. Uh, but I try to uh, steer parents' community toward the money piece about that, that we can't keep all these schools open because mm -hmm. of how much it costs to maintain. Mm -hmm. um, and then just, you have to take the criticism like like you're a duck and let the water run off your back, mm -hmm. but you keep you keep focused on what is important. Mm -hmm. And again, what's important to me are the children. Are the children, that's right. If there's anything that you, is there anything that you regret or wish that you could change um, as far as the, the, your years on the board, if there was one decision or or one incident that you could have done differently or wish, have, wish the vote would have went differently, what would that be, if any? There may not be any. And we only have one minute. Okay. Well, about 30 seconds. Okay, <laughs> there is one, um, and it's water in the bridge now, but. I wish I had fought harder to keep uh, Civic Park open. Okay. Civic Park School was our largest walk zone. Mm -hmm. And once we closed Civic Park, we lost students to two different charter schools. Okay. And that really has bothered me because the, the area around Civic Park was, was and still is mm -hmm. loaded with children. Okay. Okay, if you, this is our last 30 seconds, so we want to give you the opportunity to talk to our viewers and let them know why they should re-elect you to, to continue to serve on the Flint Community School Board. Well, to the uh, parents, to the community, I think I've done everything that you all have asked me to do. Uh, I've tried to be the voice for the students. I'm very active with the students. I work with Student Senate. I talk to students. Students have my phone number. They call mm -hmm. me a lot, <laughs> sometimes just to talk. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I've had students call me at midnight because they were afraid in the home. So I am that voice. I am that rock that, in a lot of cases, students rely on. I'm very visible. The kids see me all the time. And so, you know, if, if reelected, I will continue to do the job that I've always done, and that's to take care of my babies, because that's what I call them, my babies. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Vera, for your time. And thank you so much for tuning in to Meet the Candidate. We will return. All right, let's do the close again, and it's, uh, it's good night. Oh, good night this time. Okay. Ready. And thank you for tuning in to Meet the Candidates. Good night. Tell me when. And now. Thank you so much for tuning in to Meet the Candidates. Good night. Hello, my name is Ed Bullard from the Flint, Genesee Hate Crime Response Task Force. In Michigan, hate crimes are defined as a criminal offense committed against a person or property which is motivated in whole or in part by the offender's bias against a race, national origin, religion, sexual orientation, mental or physical disability, or ethnicity. Federal and some local laws include gender identity. Cross burning, white hoods, swastikas, and slurs may be hate crime indicators. All human beings are born free with equal dignity and rights. All blood runs red. Let's stop hate crimes. For more information, contact the Michigan Alliance Against Hate Crimes. Young men of color, come up from the gloom of national neglect. You have already been paid for. Come out of the shadow of irrational prejudices. You owe no racial debt to history. The blood of our bodies and the prayers of our souls have bought for you a future without shame.
right beyond the telling of it. Kwanzaa means access. It means access to your soul. It means access to your people. Kwanzaa is like renewing your annual membership to community, to your family, to your culture, and most importantly, to yourself. Kwanzaa is expressed throughout the world now by people of African heritage who want to have that cultural connectedness. These are principles of what we're supposed to be doing 365, you know what I mean, and how we treat each other and how we look at the world. We did not petition or ask for permission to celebrate. We did it by Kuji Jakuli, a self-determination. Welcome back to Meet the Candidates. I'm still your host, Paul Herring, and we're here talking with Mike Stikovich. He is running for the county clerk seat, correct? Correct. Great. Um, before we start our interview with him, I, again, I want to I want to make sure that I drive this point home. This is a very crucial election, and we want to encourage each of you watching to not only go to the polls, which I'm sure you will, but to fill the car up, okay? Take everyone you possibly can, your nephews, your nieces, your neighbors. It's too important for us to miss this opportunity. Vote, vote, vote. All right? And with that said, I'm going to turn it over to Michael. Michael, why don't you just tell me a little bit about yourself first? Okay, I'm a retiree from General Motors. Uh, I retired in 1991, 31 years at uh, AC, which was in spark plug that turned into AC Rochester, which turned into Delphi, but I got out before it was Delphi. And I was a, a systems analyst, a computer programmer, a, a synchronous I'm manual. Sorry, I've got a problem. Houston, we got a problem. In five, four, three. Welcome back to Meet the Candidates. I'm still your host, Paul Herring. Before I get started with this evening's interview or with the next interview, I want to remind each of you watching that this election is really crucial and it's important that we get as many people to the polls as possible. So when you're getting ready to go vote, make sure you stop by and get your uncle, your cousin, your nephew, your niece, your neighbor, fill the car up, uh, make it a party, take a picnic lunch, do whatever you need to do to make it happen, all right? With that said, I'm gonna introduce you to Michael Stikovich. He's running for the county clerk, correct? Right. Michael, why don't you tell the audience a little bit about yourself? Okay, I'm a retiree from General Motors. I was a salary employee, a computer programmer, a um, synchronous manufacturing instructor, okay. a uh, systems analyst, retired uh, 21 years ago, and uh, at one time I was a uh, high school football referee, okay. basketball referee, uh, league statistician for the International Hockey League. Okay. So I got involved in some community uh, affairs. However, sitting at home for many years watching the political scene, my wife and myself both were like typical people. Oh, why did they do this? Why'd they do that? If I could do it right, they do it, they're doing it wrong. Right, right. And after all these years, we finally decided, well, what good is sitting home complaining? Let's do something as a, as a, as a, as a citizen. Okay. So we both decided to jump in. We're raw rookies, we're not politicians. Uh, my wife is running for ninth uh, district county commissioner okay. in uh, Genesee County, and I am running for Genesee County clerk. Okay. And we've always complained about, gee, it looks like you got these politicians that all they care about is which is the next political position they can fill after they've been term limited. Right. And they jump from one job to the next, and we just do not think that's right. So, again, decided to run. And as a uh, county clerk, the position I'm running for, I have stated that I only expect to serve one term. My belief is in a four-year term, if you can't get the changes you want to get made, then maybe you're not the right person for the job. So, and I know in some jobs it takes a little longer, but my experience in manufacturing and such, 
if in the first three, four years you can't get done what you want, maybe you're not doing it right. Somebody else might have a better idea. So my pledge to the public is if I get elected, I will serve one term and that's it. Uh, at my age of 75 years of age now, I'm age limited almost. You don't have to worry about term limits. Uh, and I don't think they should be lifetime jobs. Uh, I think the, these, as a constitution, as we started as a country, it was supposed to be the taxpayer goes in, does a job, gets out. Right. And uh, you don't hang on forever. Doug, it might, uh, might take a year or so to just figure out what's going on, you know, the rules, the regulations, and all that kind of stuff. I mean, there's got to be a manual, you know, as thick as a, an encyclopedia to, as to how to do the job. Well, uh Matter of fact, yesterday, uh, to get up to speed, I met for two hours with our current county clerk okay. to find out what he would do if he was still going to be county clerk, and he is retiring, Okay. and met with the, the office staff and uh, went through the entire process they have there so to get a, a heads up on what's going to happen. And I think, well, maybe it would take a year or so, but in four years, you should be able to put in what you need to get done to make it more efficient to make sure the taxpayer is getting their money's worth. And I honestly believe with the people I met there, there is a bunch of hardworking people in the county clerk's office. Mm -hmm. I would, one thing I know that uh, I would work to try and get it staffed a, a little better. They have been counting, cutting heads, like most of the places Everywhere. in the county. Right. And it's really going to be hard to get more monies uh, for a county clerk's positions when you need police, you need fire, people don't go into panic because they have to wait an extra day to get a birth certificate. Right, right, right. So <laughs> it's not a position where people are, uh, you can get representatives at to change laws to get you money because people are pounding on their door. Right. Like a pothole or something is more important to most people. Right, right. But there's still changes that can be made. What, what makes you feel that you're qualified for the job? Well, I have been involved in many cases with, I say, my computer programming, which is very logic-based, and with my industrial experience, uh, I've been able to solve problems, especially as a systems analyst. You look at something, someone comes to you with a problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, how can we best solve this problem? How can be the best efficiencies? How, uh, what would staffing uh, needs uh, be? Uh, so I've had experience in my lifetime of work solving these types of problems. Okay. Now, I have to ask, uh, was it a, a basic or a C basic or a COBOL? What language were you writing in? We were mainly COBOL. Uh, before that, when I started, it was punch cards and there was no such thing as a computer. It was punch cards that everything was fed off of that. Then the computers came in and I got involved in that. I actually started computer programming then and uh, it evolved into COBOL. It was, it was a more basic language preceding that. Okay. When I tell my kids about the computer punch cards, they just think it's unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> so you say you're going, you're going, I'm going to go for one term. Correct. Why? I mean, why should I vote for you? Oh, that's, that's Ralph. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I have no ulterior motives going into this job. Okay. And my only uh, reason for running is to try and do a better job. Not to say that the person that's retiring didn't do a good job, but uh -huh. my sole purpose would be to improve on that and make sure that the office runs more efficient, efficiently and not get in there and having my eye on the next political job that may be opening up. My total 100% dedication will be to that job because that is it. Well, you almost have to realize that in the next four years, your budget's going to get cut. And you mentioned that one of your goals was to get the, the building staffed. How will you do that? Well, one of the main things I can think of is try and look for, right now the property taxes are what they are because we have a reduction in population. Everybody knows that. So the basic financial needs are really being stretched. Mm -hmm. I would push, and, and it's not my job, but I would push there, what other streams of income can we generate in Genesee County besides property taxes? How can we get other businesses in here? Uh, and that's not the job of the clerk, but I would push my commissioners and such to find those so that we can staff areas more efficiently and hire more people. Now, 
If it involves getting more companies here, that's easy to say. But what can we do to make it so a company wants to come here? Sometimes I think that some of our politicians get into their, their job mm -hmm. and forget it is their job. And they're collecting a paycheck, and that's number one to that person, rather than how am I spending the taxpayer's money. And along those lines, I have made a pledge that whatever the salary is for the county clerk, I, right off the bat, would give 30% of it back to be used in whatever we can use within the county clerk's position. Okay. Nice, nice. And we don't know what the salary is for that I position? think they just decided on eighty one or $82,000 a year. Okay. Because it is assuming the responsibilities now of the Register of Deeds. Okay. Uh, Rose Bogardis used to be. Right. They're eliminating that position, so now that's being taken by the county clerk. I see. I see. So, I mean, that's almost enough to hire another clerk or I would a cashier think so. or something along that lines. Or do something with it, like uh, maybe get more technology in uh, into the record keeping so that we don't have huge rooms full of paper and boxes and such because it's death certificates, divorces and such. You have to keep records for hundreds of Millennia. years. Right. <laughs> and, and then these are also things that are uh, the state and Lansing, they determine a lot of the paperwork, how long you have to keep it. Right. Well, maybe those don't have to be the rules forever. Maybe you can keep them on a flash drive or such that doesn't take a warehouse full of boxes. Right. Maybe you can reduce what you're paying to store. Well, you just use microfiche, right? Right. There is some microfiche, but there's certain things you're not allowed to, to do. do it. And I'm saying, well, why? Why? Right. Well, the old, I call it the the old Russian rule of is it good enough for me is good enough for you. Right. <laughs> well, maybe that isn't good enough. <laughs> right. 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 Sounds like an ideal opportunity to hire some kids to scan this data in yeah. and, you know, I guess you could off-site still store these things. In one of our abandoned schools, perhaps. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, I'm going to give you an opportunity to look right at the camera and talk to the folks at home and, uh, I guess, convince them to vote for you. Very good. Uh, I, it's easy for me to say this. Okay. I'm an honest person. Okay. And when I tell you I would give 30% of my salary back and I am only going to do a four-year term and I am going to do the best job I can to make that office run as efficient as possible and with no question on the population's worries about, well, one thing, for example, uh, are the voting records, you know, that's a secretary of state that does that, but are the tabulations doing right? Is somebody fooling around with that? Right. And we all hear the horror stories every year. Right. Well, my job would be to make sure that happens correctly and all records are absolutely perfect because I have no other ulterior motive. Again, I am not looking for a next position. <laughs> I'm only looking to do the job that you're hiring me to do. All right, listen, Mike Stickovich running for the county clerk He's promising no hanging chads in Genesee County, all right? So if you guys uh, want to get out and vote, perhaps he's the candidate for you. Again, you're watching Meet the Candidates. I'm your host, Paul Herring, and there'll be more. After this.